If you have your Bible, I want you to open it to Psalms 137. If you have your phone, turn on your Bible app to Psalms 137 and remain there for just a moment. And I'm going to read. I think what I'll do is go ahead and read this verse. And then I'm going to do a little exegesis of the verse and point out three points from the text. Because this verse has probably been preached on by ministers at least once in their ministry. Pastors, evangelists, and teachers. But uh, the subject may seem strange, but we're going to get something out of this. I call it hanging harps and weeping willows. Hanging harps and weeping willows. And there's a theme tonight that we'll get into. Psalms 137 verses 1 through 6, verses 1 through 6. And uh, Jonathan, I don't know if they got that to you, but for, I'm, 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 the NASB uh, translation is what I'm using. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. Now I want you to say with me, we sat down. Next verse, as we continue to read this passage, this is interesting. When we remembered Zion, we sat down and wept when we remembered. They are weeping because of remembering something that was better than where they were. Stay with me. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our hearts. Please notice that they hung them not on an oak tree, nor a maple, nor a pine, nor a cedar of Lebanon, but they specifically hung them on willows. And our captives said unto us, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then as we continue to read this, this is what the scripture says. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, or the King James says, in a strange land. So they are in a place that they are unfamiliar with, remembering a time that was better, sitting down and saying to themselves, we don't have the joy we used to have. All right. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. And let's see, do we have a couple more verses? I think that was the final. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now, I want to give you the setting of what has taken place. If you were to go to two locations, two cities, the city of Jerusalem in Judea, and the city of Babylon on the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates River, you would have two different scenes. Let's first talk about where they had been. They had been in a place where there was a magnificent temple of Solomon built by King Solomon, which today would have cost billions of dollars. There were panels of gold with carved cherubims and palm trees. I mean, this, this place had a gold Ark of the Covenant. It had a brass altar. It had a gold menorah. There were priests dressed in white. There was seven festivals a year. There were Sabbath days. There were celebrations of the new moon. And when you went to Jerusalem during a festival, you have never, even Josephus talks about it, you have never experienced anything like the Feast of Tabernacles, the dancing by the kids, the dancing by the women, the shouting, the rejoicing, the water drawing ceremony, the waving of the palm branches in the Kidron Valley to where it sounded like a rushing mighty wind was blowing in the valley just outside the eastern gate of the temple. I mean, the the temple doors, even in Christ's day, were made of Corinthian bronze in the time of the captives, the time of captivity. They were gold, gold covered wooden doors of cedars of Lebanon. So, this is the picture that they were used to the celebrations, the joy, the family time together coming up to the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, the city that's the apple of God's eye. Now, I want you to see where they're at. They had been taken by King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar invaded the area in three of the invasions. He invaded Israel. Then he invaded Judea. And the last thing he took was Jerusalem. So the people there, honestly, if you read the book of Jeremiah, they didn't believe God would let the city fall. They thought it was a false prophecy from a maniac prophet by the name of Jeremiah that spent too much time in the mire of a dungeon. 
But let me tell you what happened. When the, when the temple was burnt and the smoke was ascending, Nebuchadnezzar and his guards were locking people, children, men, and women with leg irons and irons around their arms. Check this out. This blew my mind. I did not know this till yet till today. From the city of Jerusalem at the Temple Mount, coming down to the Dead Sea area, the lowest part of the earth, and taking that valley, which is called the Jordan Valley, up into Syria and through Lebanon, through the mountains. Do you know how long they had to walk, not ride, no horses, no donkeys, 1,600 miles? It would be like walking from Cleveland, Tennessee to Las Vegas, Nevada. Walking. The scholars say it took them, if they walked every day so many miles, four to five months to get to the city of Babylon. You know, you're there in this city and it's a strange tongue. Honestly, it would be like dropping you as an American right in the heart of Mexico. And everybody is speaking Spanish, but you've never taken the course. You have no idea what anybody's saying. So they're walking into a language that they don't understand. They're passing temples. Oh yes, temples. But not one temple to Yahweh. There is the temple of Marduk sitting on 60 columns high in the air with carved elephants around it. They pass another temple to another idol god. Perhaps Isis was worshipped. Even some of the early, early Roman gods that were passed down to the Greeks, perhaps they were worshipped. So they're in a place of absolute idolatry. In a place where they do not understand anybody's language. In a place where they are now going to be told how to live, what they can eat, how to work, when to get up, when to go to bed, and who they can pray to and who they can worship. I would like to suggest a question for you to ponder. If that were you with your kids, how would you feel? Do you think you would feel like singing? Do you think you would want to take the harp and play it? Do you think you'd want to sit around and say, hey guys, let's get that praise him. God is good all the time. It's so easy to say God is good all the time when all your time is good. But I tell you, it'll wreck your nerves and get on the last nerve of your spirit when hell's breaking loose and they're reminding you God is good. Come on, I'm being blunt with you right here. Somehow you know he is, but it just don't feel like he's too good right now. And you want people to know how you feel and you express it. But I want to show you a spiritual principle that the Spirit of God gave me about what they are doing. God Almighty clap your hands one time before the Lord before we get started because like I said I want the, there's a spiritual principle here that I want to show you now in the text there are three things that they the adversary did to them and some of it they submitted to are you ready say I'm ready the first thing they did was the Bible said they sat down by the river of Babylon. Now, if we look at things like rain, rain represents literal rain, but rain represents the outpouring of the Spirit. If we look at rivers in the Bible, there are literal rivers that are named for rivers that ran through the Garden of Eden, for example, two rivers, the Hittichel and the Tigris, that are the Euphrates and the Tigris that runs through Babylon. So rivers are rivers. But in your Bible in John 7, he said, out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living in water. So the imagery of a river in the Bible can often be applied to the flowing of the Spirit of God. So let us say that here is the church represented by the captives in Babylon. And what have they done? Instead of ministering who the real God is at the temples and said, this is not the real God. Let me tell you about the real God. I might be a captive, but I can tell you the stories about a God who can open up a red
Red Sea, a God that can put manna for 40 years in the wilderness, a God that can provide water from a rock, a God that can make your clothes not wear out in 40 years. Would you like for me to tell you about a real God who can hear when you pray, see and watch you, speak to you in the middle of the, would you like for me not to talk about Murdoch who's sitting up there who can't hear, see, or to let me talk to you about the God I know. Are they doing that? No. Right next to a flow, they have decided to sit down. Now, I just want to talk about sitting down near the flow because uh, I've got to be careful with this because I know that we are all older. I don't have the knees I used to have. Uh, I used to jump in church. I, Jake, I could jump as high as you. I could almost dunk a basketball. I wouldn't try to do it now. I mean, I, when, I, when, I, when I jump now, the best you're going to get out of me is three inches from the back of my heels rocking back and forth. That's about to jump. So I understand that we're older. I understand we don't shout maybe as hard as we used to or jump jump as high as we used to. But I want to tell you something. Uh, there's this spiritual principle about sitting too long. Let me say it this way. We sit down too long and we get up too soon. Because what happens to us is, I, and I've seen it even here at times, our worship is going, and I appreciate that the majority of our people, no matter how they feel or how old they are, they'll stand to their feet to honor God. But there's nothing worse than when the Spirit of God is moving in the flow, and you're sitting down with your arms folded, and your, 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 your physical expression, your body language is showing everybody that you're not a bit interested in anything going on there, and you're your mind is actually somewhere else. Let me talk to you about people who sit too long. The Bible tells us in a story about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who were all three brothers and sisters, that Jesus dropped by the house. And there were three different types of reaction from three people. The Bible said that Martha served, Mary worshipped, and Lazarus sat. Let me say it again. Lazarus sat, Martha is, is working or serving, and Mary is worshiping. And we want to fuss at Martha. Martha, you need to put the food down. Martha, you quit setting the table. You need to be in here worshiping God. Can I tell you something? You got to have a Pam Stone in every ministry. While we're out there talking about Jesus and hooking and bucking and shucking around, we got to have a Pam in there cooking saying, y'all have church while I take care of business. Because I got news for you. When I get through shouting and rolling around. I want something to eat. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if mama's over here shouting with me, the food's going to be late and I'm going to be fussing because the food's late. I'm going to tell you, you got to have servers in the house of God. Yeah, you got to have worshipers in the house of God. Uh, but watch this. When you're, when you're serving, you're still living. <laughs> when you're worshiping Mary, you're still living. And the Bible says Lazarus sat. Guess who died? Hey, hey, here's what I want to tell you. By sitting when they should be standing, by being silent when they should be worshiping, they are saying we are stuck in one place because when you're sitting, you're not moving. When you're sitting, you're in one location. So my point is that there is no movement going around when the river is flowing. The river is passing by. The Holy Spirit is flowing. Is anybody getting the analogy here? They're, but what has happened is they are stuck near the presence, but they're not doing anything when the flow is going on because they're stuck because they're sitting. What are they stuck on? I'm going to go ahead and preach this right here. Here's what they're stuck on. They're stuck on their past. They they're stuck in the past. They're stuck in, oh God, if we were only at such and such a place, we could really have them. Oh God, if we were only back at the temple, I'd love to be back there.
there and just hear the sound of the Levite singers. Oh, God. So they're saying to them, we heard y'all know how to sing. We heard that when you sing, your God shows up. Why don't you sing us one of your songs? And they said, you don't understand the condition that we're in. We don't have a song to sing. We've taken our harps. I'm going to preach this in a minute. And we hung them on the willow trees, and we just cannot sing God's song in a really weird, strange land. God, the pro- what is the problem with that? The problem is with that is this. We are the exact same way in our walk with God if we are always living in the past, wishing something could have been done different, something could have been done better. Why did we do it that way? Why don't we do it this way? So instead of mm, getting into the flow of where you're at at the moment and saying, I'm standing up because the river's going this way, so let's let's get in the river and let's ride the wave a little bit. Let's get in the river and get our feet wet just a little bit. No, what are we going to do? Well, I just tell you what, I know we have good services on Tuesday night, but oh, if you'd have been here tw- five years ago in the old sanctuary, when we were standing around the walls, standing around the walls, you all hated that because you'd come to church and couldn't even find a seat. 50 people leaving at one time because there wasn't no seat. You remember those days? You remember those days? Were you here then? Yeah, you remember those days. And, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's crowded and, and you, you don't have anywhere to sit. Oh, but no, let's go back to that day. No, 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 no. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Do not say to yourself, the former days are better than today for this is not wise. That's what Solomon said. I go to Alabama to preach. <laughs> I go to this brand new building. It's a beautiful building. The building held 800 people. A brand new building. And we're running two to 300 people, which is not bad because the church averaged about two to 300 at that time, maybe on a good Sunday, 400. And I'm having these older people come to me, and they're wonderful people. Brother Purry, <laughs> you know what state you're in by how they say your name. It's Alabama is usually Perry. Virginia is Purry, Brother Purry. <laughs> Tennessee is Purry, Purry, Purry. It's Purry, 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 Peary, Peary, Brother Peary. <laughs> Go to New York, it's a whole nother twist up there. <laughs> Brother Purry, you should have been here 40 years ago in the church when we had that big 10 week revival. Well, what happened? My brother, let me tell you something. Crowds were so big that they were five and ten deep standing outside the window to listen week after week after week. And I'm depressed because I'm saying, my God, I can't even get 300 people in the building. And I'm, I'm going to the room. Pam knows how I used to be. I'm going to the room all depressed. Well, how come people don't come to church now? What's wrong with me? Uh, the, you know, how come people don't want to come out and have revival? We stayed there three weeks, but it's like, you know. And then they finally tell me how big the church was. It seated 50. And I calculated in this church that seated no more than 80, that if you put 80 inside the church and you put them eight deep around the church, I was running more than they were in the old church. Because the building was small, it looked bigger. When your building is big, it takes more to fill it up. Somebody help me on this subject right here if you know what I'm saying. Rule number one is don't sit when you should be standing. That's right. When the flow is there, don't just sit in it. Get in it. Somebody tweet that. Don't just sit in it. Get in it. So that was the first thing they did wrong is they sat too long where the flow was coming. And it says this. They hung their harps on the willow. All kinds of trees in the Bible, and they all represent something. There is the oak tree. There is the cedar of Lebanon, which is tall in strength, so, uh, representing strength. There is the uh, uh, palm tree, which out, 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 anybody knows a palm tree outlasts storms. So every tree represents a characteristic of the life of a believer. Extremely strong, enduring a storm. But here's the thing about a willow. Ready? There are trees, and you've seen them growing up, called the weeping willow. And everybody knows biblically that a willow tree represents sorrow. 
And a willow tree represents, I have a friend of mine, and uh, he's from a very dysfunctional family. I'm glad he's not here tonight. I wouldn't want him to hear me say this, but he's watching right now. I know because he told me I was, I ain't gonna, no, I ain't going to say his name. But he's, he said, man, my family wrote the book on dysfunctional. And he, he's told me stories about the family. And I'm telling you, that, 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 let me just say, he is not exaggerating. And he said, when they asked me about my family tree, I told him, it's a weeping willow. It's a weeping willow. <laughs> now get the picture here. They've sat beside a river that represents the flow. But now they have hung, willfully chosen to take their harps and hang them on a willow tree. Now, here's my question. Why'd you bring your dumb harps with you to begin with if you're not going to use them? Leave your harps in Jerusalem if you're not going to use them. If all you're going to do is hang them on a tree and look at them, what good are they going to do? Now, here's the thing. Now, now don't you miss what I'm about to say. I'm going to do a YouTube video called On the Power of the Harp, and it's very interesting, and I'm going to try to share this with you briefly. The harp is heaven's instrument, not trumpets, not shofars. Trumpets are used in God's judgments in the book of Revelation. But the elders have harps. Stay with me. And the harps, and I don't want to go into the history of the harps because it's very complicated, but Jubal was the father of all stringed instruments, including the harp. That goes back to the book of Genesis very early at creation. But doctors have used harps and harp music to lower blood pressure. It this is a fact. The universities have studied this. Real harp music changes the molecular structure of the cells in the human body. But here's the big one. When David as a boy sat before Saul, it says that King Saul was troubled by an evil spirit. How many know what I'm saying? And when King Saul was troubled, they said, what can we do to help the king? And someone said on staff, go get a cunning harp player. Do you know any? Well, there's this little, little guy from Bethlehem, and we can get him in here. You know, this is the guy that killed the giant. Okay, bring him in. So David is a late teens, probably about 19 at the time, maybe 18, 19. He brings his harp in. This is in your Bible. He begins to play the harp, and it says, skillfully, cunningly, he's, meaning he knows, now stay with me, how to shift an atmosphere with it. That's what that alludes to. Doesn't mean he's a good harp player. God Almighty. It means when you put him on the platform, the atmosphere shifts. Aren't you glad, and I mean this sincerely, and I'm not saying this to pat people on the back, but they deserve it. Don't you, aren't you glad that this ministry, RAMP, OCI, VOE, we're all together. Aren't you glad that we have a team that can shift the atmosphere on a Tuesday night, no matter what the atmosphere is? Because they are anointed to shift. So when he began to play the harp, it shifted Saul. And here's what the Bible said. And King Saul was refreshed and made well, and he was renewed. All because of... Our, now, now, now get what I'm about to say. These people are depressed. Would you agree with me? I oh, can't see the Lord saw a strange land. I hope my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. I want that tongue to cleave to the roof of my mouth. I'm not even going to sing a tongue. It ain't going to make me. Now watch, watch, the, watch the revelation here. The instrument that could have broken their depression is hanging up right in front of them. And instead of them taking the thing that in their own Bible, in their own history, and in their own scriptures, because this is Babylon, and David had already come and gone, and they knew the stories of the harp, and they knew the stories of the harp at the temple, and what it was used for to shift the atmosphere. 
They take the thing that could, if they played it, my God, I feel something. And if they would play it, and if they would sing, they could relieve their own sorrow. They could relieve their own depression. But you've got to understand, some people love drama more than deliverance. That's right. I could preach that right there a while. Hanging harps on willows. Here's a real problem. The reason people can't get free when they could get free is they have too many hang-ups. <laughs> and everybody gets near them and knows what their hang-ups are. They are bitter, and they will let you know. They, are, they have been done wrong. They will let you know. Someone has mistreated them and in the body of Christ and they're angry and they will let you know. Preach on, Perry. I'm going to. And they've hung up what could help them. This is not everybody, but let me tell you a few. For whatever reason, people go through stuff, right? Sometimes it's family issues. Sometimes it's issues with your children. Every local church I know in America that I've ever preached in has had a church split except Tommy Bates. I've been preaching 45, 46 years, and every church I've ever walked in, pastors have stories where a staff member tried to start a church outside the church in the same town. That happens. It's happened in every church I've been to where uh, somebody got mad and tried to abuse the, the preacher or start stories about him. I, 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 that, that hasn't happened to everybody, but that has happened to pastors where I've been. Uh, I know guys that's been lied on, and it was proven later. The, it, it's real funny. The paper will put you on the front page till the story changes. Yeah, that's right. And then the rebuttal that you were lied on goes on page 20 where the comics are. Right. Yeah. This has happened to friends of mine, so I'm not making up a story. <laughs> Stay with me. Everybody I know has been through something. But let me tell you what you got to be careful for. You have to be careful. I had a guy call me, and I'm not telling you who he was. He's a, he's a great friend. He's a, he's a friend of this ministry. He's not been around for a while because he is, his job has kept him so busy almost six days a week. I mean, just no time. And he said to me, he said, two men walked into my shop, Perry, months and months ago, and started laying eggs in my ear. You ever read that about the fly eggs? You ever hear Jensen preach on snake eggs? Snake eggs? I preached on fly eggs. Remember the Bible said about the anointing? What happens? Dead flies in the ointment. Is it, is it, is it in the Bible? There's dead flies in the ointment. Flies lay eggs. Do you know what drives sheep crazy? I've been to the Middle East and had him explain this to me. Flies that lay eggs in the nose... And in the ear. And a sheep has no hands to scratch. And those sheep, the shepherd says, when they get on their back and start doing this, and they start rubbing their nose, they can make it bleed. They rub it in the dirt trying to get the fly eggs out. And I said, how do you get it out? They said, you take anointing olive oil Come on. and tar, huh. and you rub it inside the nose, and the flies can't stand the oil. Yes, <laughs> You're going to get this in a minute. So when you put that tar with the oil in the nose and around the ear, the flies won't lay eggs in it. And this, this young man said to me, apologize. He was actually weeping and apologizing. He said, I let people lay eggs in my ears and they hatched. And then God started giving me dreams and showing me the very opposite, that the men laying the eggs were evil and wrong. Come on. Come on. Are, you are you tracking with me? So what are we talking about right here? We're talking about those people in Babylon took the thing that could help them and instead of taking the harp off the willow, which that instrument played right would relieve their depression and give their joy back, they hung it up. Watch out. They, can I say it this way? They hung their destiny up and they gave it up because they just didn't have any joy left. The joy of their salvation had gone. And the very, watch me now, watch me now. 
Watch this. Please listen in the spirit I'm saying this. Bradley County has 380 churches. That's the last count. Now, some of them have closed down, I found out, because their congregations have passed away, so the buildings are there. So let's just say that if we count even the buildings that are closed, that's how you get that number. The, the, the real number is more like 300. Now, this county has 110,000 people. I want you to divide 300 into 100,000, and somebody tell me what you come up with. What now? Pam. Pam, you're the mathematician. You should have figured this out before I even said it. Huh? There's about 366 person, people for every church in this county if everybody went to church. But 60% to 70% of this county does not go to church. So 30% of the people out of 110,000 people are attending over 300 churches in this county, which, which would say to me, that you can be a Piccadilly Christian and pick and choose when you go through the line what you want. Barna says, Barna says that the average church in America, average Christian in America, now has three churches they choose from on any Sunday. Ricky Shapiro sent me an article that says that as of now in America, only 13% of the people tithe. Let me say it again. Only 13% of the American Christians still tithe. Ten years ago, it was 40. But I'm going to tell you something about this place. And that's why some of you have been here from the start, and the devil couldn't pull you away. Because <laughs> he tried. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The enemy couldn't pull you away somebody's eggs in your ear can't pull you away. And you know why? Because there's something special about this place. We don't believe in hanging our harps on a willow tree. Come on, I'm going to go ahead and preach it. We believe if something's breaking out, we have a prayer meeting. We believe if hell's busting up somebody's family, we bring them in and lay hands on them and begin to bind the powers of the enemy. Aren't you glad there is a place? I know there's more than one, but aren't you glad there is a place in Cleveland, Tennessee, that if you want to be healed, take them on down to that place. If you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, take them on down to that place. If you wanted to pray for you and cast that devil out of you, take them on down to that place. Aren't you glad that we are anti-harp hanging people? Did you hear what I said? We are anti-harp hanging people. We believe you. My I want somebody to put your hands together like you mean it when you're clapping. Oh, God Almighty. Yes. <laughs> Watch. They took their harps with them, but they lost their song because <laughs> their worship was based on their circumstances. Come on. Let me say it again. <clears throat> Anybody out there? Y'all go home. Their worship was based on their circumstances. If I have joy, I can worship. If I feel the anointing, I can worship. If I'm in a church I like, I can worship. And the captives said, the ca those who took him captive said, sing, let, let's see you sing now. I want to say this and really mean it. The joy of the Lord is not dependent on location, situation, or frustration. Can I run that through the bridge one more time? The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 10. But the joy of the Lord is never dependent upon location, meaning whatever building I'm in. I can go to a tent and feel it. I can go to a barn and feel it. Come on, we prayed in the barn before and felt it, right? We can go to the TLR Global Center and feel it. We can come here and feel it. We can go outside and have a meeting and see it. Join hands in the middle of a ball field and feel it. Because my location doesn't matter. My situation doesn't matter. My frustration doesn't matter. I would like to prove it to you in the life of one man, Jesus Christ. And I want to give you 48 hours. And I want to show you, I want to show you what is happening to him in 48 hours. 
a multitude of people as he has rolled a colt in with its mama into the city across the three-tiered ramp into the eastern gate on the Temple Mount platform. And they're saying, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Hosanna, Lord, save us. And they're throwing palm branches down. Palms represent victory. And what they think is he's going to be the king. He's a miracle worker. He can raise dead people. So this is the Messiah, and he's going to take over Rome and go and defeat Rome, and he's coming to the, watch this, he's coming to the temple to take things over. And they had it all messed up because he did not come the first time to build a political kingdom. He came the first time to build a spiritual kingdom. His first coming was about defeating sin and death so that his kingdom would come and you could have eternal life. That's what, that's, that was his purpose. Watch what happens. They are all praising him. He is the king. Thy king, they knew the prophecy. Your king comes to you riding upon a colt. Zechariah talked about it. All of a sudden, the atmosphere begins to shift. He goes into what's called the Last Supper, which is actually the Pas a Passover Supper. And he goes into a room with his inner circle. And weird things start happening because he realizes my time is about up. Judas is there and he knows by the scripture he's about to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by his own familiar friend who ate bread with him according to Psalms. He knows it. How would you like to sit knowing that the person having dinner with you is about to kill you? Would that not make you want to call security and get rid of the person before it happened? He knows this man is going to have him help get me killed. And he still sits there with him and says, Judas, my friend. Judas, my friend. He knows this. Moses and Elijah have already met with him on the Mount of Transfiguration to show him about his suffering he has already told the disciples, they are going to kill me. I'll raise, but they're going to kill me. He knows the prophecy of Isaiah. Like a lamb going to slaughter, he can't open his mouth. He, he knows he can call legions of angels, but if he does, the whole plan is ruined for everybody. He knows that. He knows, how would you, I mean, just let's stop. How would you know, how would you like it if you knew you are going to be beheaded in about 12 hours? I mean, let's stop, let's stop and think and really make it real personal. How would you like the fact that the prophecies have said a thousand years before you got there, they're going to pierce your hands and feet? Psalms 22, they're going to gamble for your garment. They're going to wag their heads like dogs at you. Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, he knows everything that's going to happen. Here's my, here's my question for you. How do you feel knowing that's coming? Could you sing? I mean, not, come on, be honest. Well, yeah, if I was with you. No, be honest with me. They all ran. When he gets arrested, they all run. Guys, he's poured into for three and a half years. John is the only one that stays with him, and Peter kind of tags along. How would you feel? So, your treasurer of your church has betrayed you to set you up to have you arrested. You are about to be beaten with the cat of nine tails that they can't even tell that you're a human. You're going to have to carry a cross to the top of a hill with the help of a man named Simon from Cyrene. And they're going to put nails in both of your hands and your feet, a crown of thorns on your head, spit on you and slap you. And you're the very one that helped God create things in the beginning. And you got to put a, you got to put a, if you want men in heaven with you, you got to put up with it. So how does Jesus react? Does he get angry? Does he stress out? When he goes to the garden, his sweat becomes his great drops of blood. That's stress. Medical doctors say that's a rare instance. It's only happened a few times in history. And you've got to be under stress for your capillaries to expand to that point and blood to come through your skin. Jesus is stressed to the max as a man. But I would like to read to you how he is reacting after Judas leaves. And when they sang a hymn... 
they went to the Mount of Olives and they went there because the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. Wait a minute. They sang a hymn. So I did a little bit of research from a Hebraic perspective and found out that this is near Passover. And near Passover, there are certain hymns or psalms that the Jews sing, and they are known as Hallel Psalms. Yes. A Hallel Psalm begins with, Praise ye the Lord. And praise the Lord is hallelujah in the Hebrew language. Praise ye Yah, praise the Lord, praise God. Those Psalms happen to run between 113 to 118. During the entire time, there are certain verses selected in the ancient days for them to sing of the Holy So Passover is a time of redemption. Passover is a time of remembering. God brought us out of bondage. God kept us from the death angel. God brought us across the Red Sea. But here's some of the Psalms. They compass me round about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Psalms 118, 11. Psalms 118, 16. This are the Psalms in the Hallel. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of God did violently. Vi violently. 116, 3 through 4. They know these. You understand what I'm saying? This is the season to sing these songs. The sorrows of death compass me. And the pains of hell have got a hold on me. I found trouble and sorrow, but then I called on the name of the Lord God. I beseech you, O oh God, deliver my soul. And I got to reading these and I said, wow, right there in these Hallel Psalms are prophecies that can directly relate to what he's about to go through. But hey, Samuel, I got to this one and it blew my mind. I had to throw down my Bible and cry and run at the same time because here he is about to go. Here's the king about to go to the cross. Here's the king about to take a beating. You couldn't, you couldn't survive most beatings like that with the cat of nine tails 39 different times with over 400 stripes coming across your body and blood and flesh laying on the ground. How are you going to take that? They're spitting on you, slapping you, putting a crown of thorns with the thorns from an acacia tree that thick on top of your head and Jesus sings what I'm about to tell you. I researched it and this is one of the things they sing. Hell's about to break loose. Death is on its way. The worst pain a man could endure in history is about to happen. But in Psalms 118.24 he says this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let me say it again. This is a day that, are you kidding me? This is a day that God has made and your best friends turned on you and betrayed you. This is a day that the Lord has made when you're about to be sold like a cow for 30 pieces of silver. This is a day that the Lord has made when your sweat's about to become great drops of blood. This is a day that the Lord has made when you're go they're going to nail you like an animal to a piece of wood. This is a day the Lord has made when your back is going to be in so much pain you can hardly stand even being alive. He said, let me tell you the why he could sing this is a day that the Lord has made because Paul in the book of Hebrews explains and I've got to tell you this he said for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross he despised the shame and he has sat down at the right hand of the father let me tell you what he knew he knew it's hell today but it's heaven in four days it's hell today but in four days all power will be given to me both in heaven and in earth and I'm going to come out of the grave swinging the keys of death in hell I got to tell somebody in this house if you want peace and you want victory and if you want depression broken get your harp off the willow tree and sing a song and say, don't care what it
it looks like. This is still a day the Lord has made. Don't care what it feels like. Cut somebody better. I wish I could get some response. I can't get nobody to help me up in here right now. I, Sing, King. You're wearing a crown of thorns today, but there's going to be many crowns on your head when you come back on a while. Sing, King. Just sing. Sing, King, because three days from now, you're going to bring the dead out of hell with you, out of paradise. Three days from now. You're going to stand at God's right hand with your own blood and open up an access of fountain in the house of David for redemption. Sing, King. Sing by faith. Come on. Sing by faith when you're in Babylon. Sing by faith when the, cap, when the enemy says, can you sing now? Say, just listen. I have heard people say, when I got the baptism in the Holy Ghost and was speaking tongues, the enemy would tell me it's not real. And I'd say, what are you doing listening to him if you know it's the enemy? <laughs> and they'd say, well, I never thought about that. <laughs> and one time, just it was a long time ago, but I'm just praying and I'm in the Holy Ghost and you could hear that, that voice. This ain't real. What if this ain't real? What if all oh, this is fake? What now? I'm not telling you I'm believing this. I'm hearing this. And I said, hey devil, watch this. And I want to tell you, he didn't hang around long. And I don't know what I said when I spoke in the Holy Ghost that time, but whatever it was, he couldn't take it. And the voices left. Hallelujah. I'm trying to tell somebody, it might be somebody watching me. Get your song back. Sing when you don't feel like singing. Worship when you don't feel. I watched a man. I got one more thing to tell you. After one more thing after this. I watched a man. <laughs> I got something good. Hang on. I was in Virginia. I was about 11 or 12 years of age as a kid. And our state youth director was a guy named Charles Sestar in a big old knot. I remember, I mean, I used to hang out at the state office and I'd go to youth camp and walk in there with the preachers. I was just a kid. But he had a knot the size of a golf ball that showed up right here, right there. And it was, I mean, it looked like he had a golf ball. So when they took it out, they said, you've got not only cancer, but that cancer has already gotten into all your lymph nodes and everything. And I remember a lot of people were praying for him to be healed. I remember this. I remember that. Uh, I mean, I was a kid, but I was even. So one night at the camp meeting, totally unexpected. Now get the picture. It's an open air tabernacle. The ends are open. It's all metal. It's summer. It's pretty warm. We've all got our suits and ties on. It's about 100 degrees out. That I don't. I don't. Thankfully, we don't, have, we don't have to dress that way now, thankfully, just all I'm going to say. <laughs> Hallelujah's right. Thank that, uh, this day finally came, brother. I rejoiced to see this day and saw it. Hallelujah, like the Bible says. Okay, and an ambulance pulls up, and we're all looking at the ambulance thinking, has somebody had a heart? Usually if somebody's sick, I mean, there's a crowd gathered or people are praying, and, everybody's, and everybody kind of stood up at that point, and here comes a star on a cot, and, they, and now he's already been to the hospital, he's been to surgery, he's been to chemo, and he's dying. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. We all know sitting out there without a total miracle, he's dying. But I saw something remarkable. I wish they'd had a camera back then to record this. Just every now and then, I'd play it. And they gave him a mic, and he doesn't get up, he doesn't shout, he doesn't run, because he has no strength left. And he says, ah. I wanted to be in one more camp meeting. And you know, in your spirit, you know, it's like your faith wants something different, but somehow you just know this is really going to be his last camp meeting. And I know people are praying and believing, but it's as though he, he how can I say this? In my opinion, 
because I knew the family real well. His, his, his boys were, in fact, when, when the funeral took place, I watched their youngest boy, and they said, do not tell this boy his daddy died. We're on a swing. He says, my daddy's in the hospital. He's going to come home anytime, and they're having the dad's funeral. They didn't let the little boy go. So we were close to this family. I was. And I remember, I never forgot this. He said, I want to be in the presence of God with you one more time. He couldn't even talk. Whisper. And then all of a sudden, unexpected, he starts singing. He's like, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. And the, and the people are singing with him. And something really, this is what freaked people out. They thought he'd got healed. All of a sudden, that voice where he could not talk went, through it all, just like that. Through it all, I've learned. I'm telling you, they were running the aisles. They were kicking chairs over. I'm in the back squalling like a baby. And his full voice came back. His full strength came back. But I'll never forget that. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Two men. Sometimes the enemy makes a mistake. And the biggest mistake the enemy made with Paul and Silas is he stuck them in the same prison. It would have been far better to put Paul on one end and Silas on the other, but they didn't use wisdom because all it takes is two or three gathered in the name of the Lord, and he's in the midst of them. Two or three. <laughs> if any two of you shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done than my Father which is in heaven. So it says that it's midnight, and they have been beaten, and they're laying. Now, if you understand this, they're either sitting up, against a wall, and their feet are in stocks, meaning it's wood, just like picture the yoke of an ox, but your one leg goes in here, one leg goes in there, and they fasten them, and you can't get up and walk. And they've just been beaten. Now, I would be saying, I just, I just wish I hadn't done this crusade. <laughs> I should have stayed home with Pam. You know, I had to check in my spirit when I got on the plane. Here, I'm stuck in this. That would be me. I'm really serious. That would be me, you know. And somebody says, you want to sing? I don't feel like singing, stupid. Have you seen my back? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sing. I'm going to pray God kill all of them. Hey, all y'all in this jail that beat me. I'm praying God going to kill all of you and put you in hell before the night's over. <laughs> Is anybody like a Perry Stone in this place? Does anybody understand? I mean, they just beat you. The, what, they, what the words you beat me for? I'm minding my business preaching. Leave me alone. Let me preach. Dude, I'm, going, I'm just going to be honest with you. I just wish some people would learn how to go away. <laughs> Leave me and my wife alone. Go away. Goodbye. Adios. Hasta luego. Whatever that means in Spanish. I hope I wasn't cussing when I said that. <laughs> Was it okay? Was it okay? <laughs> what do you do? What, what do you do? Midnight, they decide to get their harp off the willow. Are you tracking with me? I'm trying to help somebody in this place today. And at midnight, it says, they sang praises unto God. Now, can I tell you that Psalms is the hymn book? Psalms were never intended to be read. They are all intended to be sung. Am I right, Mr. Cloud over here? It's the hymn book of Israel, Psalmos, Psalmos. The Psalms are songs, and they're all done in the synagogue with the cantor up and down, you know, that kind of thing. So I said to myself, self, what psalm would they have picked out? There is a Psalms in 102, 17 through 20. And I want to tell you about that Psalm. I quote, He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise his prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created will praise the Lord. For he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven 
did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner to loose them who are appointed unto death. And when Paul and Silas got to the loose him part, God in heaven was patting his foot to the music. I'm going to preach it the way I want to. <laughs> and the big toe of God hit the jail cell. Oh, mm. and the jailhouse began to rock. And when the jailhouse rocked, the chains came off, the stocks got broken, the prison doors got open, and the jailer is so afraid he's about to stab himself because any missing prisoner means he's a dead man because he's supposed to be sure nobody escapes. And Paul said, don't do yourself any harm for we, that's the whole prison, are all here. And not only did Paul get a prison break by singing a song, but Paul also won the jailer and his entire house to the Lord within 24 hours. Now here's what I've come by to tell you. you. You have to have the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8 and 10. But in order to have the joy of the Lord, you can't let the devil steal your song. You've got to get you some music in the morning or in the, I'm going to tell you, when I get to feel a heaviness, when I get a heaviness in my spirit. The Bible says he'll give you the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Get some music that'll get you revved up. Get you some music that'll put joy back in you. Turn that thing on and say, devil, I'm not going to listen to words. You're going to have to listen to what I'm listening to. Somebody give the Lord a praise in this house. Would you praise him? Put your hands together, everybody, and bless him. In this part of the service, we're about to go in the next few moments. When I was preparing to give this to you, it seemed that I saw in my heart, in my spirit, you might say, people that have been very heavy with a type of oppression or depression of, of in your mind. Some of you are not people that easily become that way. But there are two people here. One is a girl, one is a young guy. How do I know? Has anybody told me this? Nobody but the Spirit. You battled depression. And I'm going to read your mail through the Holy Ghost. You battled depression so heavy, it's caused terrible conflict in your family. Your family believes that you have anger problems, but they don't understand the root of what you feel going on in your body. The Lord says that some people will diagnose you as being bipolar. If you went to a clinic and you told them what you were dealing with, you, they would say you're manic depression, depressant. You have ma you, it's a mania with you. You, 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 you have this. There's nothing you can do about it. And so they want to put you on medication and medicine, try to help control it. But here's what happens. Now, I'm telling you, this is for someone, everything I'm saying is for somebody here. This is a word of knowledge. And I know when the Lord operates this. The problem with the med medication is when you try to take it, it makes the depression work. And there's been... There's been several times that you've actually had real heavy suicidal tendencies, but you've been smart enough to not just uh, shut yourself up, although you've done that at times, but you've been smart enough to trust just a handful of people. And when I talk about a handful, I'm talking about less than a handful, like, you know, to kind of just say, well, I'm not, you, you know, I'm not feeling well. I feel real down right now. And you, you battled this. I'm not going to give you the, the list of what's caused it because it, some of you know what's caused it. You know you've been through stuff that's caused it. You know you have listened to things that's caused it. You know that you've had uh, people try to speak into your life, but because of the situation, all this that you go through, this, this mush mush of just confusion, spirit of confusion that you feel, you don't, and I want to say this, this is for the girl. You don't listen well. You have been told, and let me just say this up front. Somebody saying, somebody just said, someone has talked to him about me. That's right. The Holy Spirit's talking to me about you. This is not a parent that's come to me. I don't get emails or letters. Uh, I'm bringing my kids to church tonight. And, and if I did, I don't pay attention because I, I don't want to know nothing going on. So when the Spirit of God moves, people know God loves them enough to reveal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, 
but you've been told, and you're a young lady, but you've been told, you just don't listen. You're stubborn, and you just don't listen. And you, the Lord, and I'm telling you what the Spirit of God's giving me. The Lord's telling me you do have a tendency of really a lot of times not paying careful attention. And you have got yourself in the past in some situations, you know, trouble situations, however you want to call it, because you, you, sh you should have listened when you didn't. But listen to what the Lord says. That's all past. Amen. The reason he's given me this to tell you is to tell you he knows your situation. The only reason he's the only reason he's bringing this up is to let you know, hey, you know what? That preacher don't know nothing about me, and God knows about me. Wow, this is crazy. That's all that's true. God knows. But he's saying to you, all this, all this you've gone through is gone. You got to start today new. Okay? Now, in a moment, I'm going to give an altar call for everybody. And whoever these two are, you will come up here. I have the assurance of the Lord that you're hungry enough for God to touch you that I'm not going to have to beg you or ask twice. But there, there are people here who are battling very heavy heaviness and depression lately. And, you know, some of you have lost family. That's normal. Some of you have gone through some stuff. That's normal. Some of you have maybe had a job loss. It's normal. But now it's getting abnormal. Does that make sense? It's gone beyond a normal sorrow, a normal pain, a normal I'm having a rough week to very heavy oppression. Now, God is going to f set some people free. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to do this. Even if you say, I think it might be me. That's all you need. If you think, don't sit there if you think it might be. And you say, well, I go up there, you know, I sing on the praise team or I go to church and everybody's going, no, 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 no. Quit thinking like that. That's the enemy trying to stop you. Dear Lord, I've given an altar call for preachers to get right with God and have half of the congregation come forward, okay? And it doesn't mean they're out there committing adultery and sinning and doing wrong. They just, they were just struggling with something. Fear, depression, anxiety. All right, when I start praying, come out of your seat, stand on the left and on the right, and there should be a number of people that come up here. And then our prayer teams are going to come up immediately after we get you up here, okay? But I'm telling you, don't leave on this one. <laughs> don't go out the door after hearing this one because God really wants to touch you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to hold a microphone in your face. That is not going to happen. But I have to know that you are listening to the voice of the Lord, okay? So when I start praying, start walking, come out of the seat. Doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you even go here and you're a part of the fellowship, but come on the left and the right, right now in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. I want to bless you for all the ones that are going to be coming up here, Lord. And Lord, we're going to pray. God's going to deliver. God's going to set free. And if you want to stand, you want to kneel, you want to get comfortable, however you want to pray. Now, here's what I need. We're going to start laying hands on people and praying and agreeing. And I want all of you that have come forward to open up your heart to God. And I want you to say, Lord, I heard what Brother Perry said. And I want you to be, I want to be free from this. Would you? And I want you to say it with your mouth, not just with your mind. All right. I need about 10 to 15 of our prayer team. And prayer team, you might as well... Get ready for more of this. This is going to happen all the time, okay? It's going to happen all the time from here on out because we're over COVID now in Jesus' name. So we're going to start praying. for. We couldn't pray for a long time, Sam. You know that. So come on right now, prayer team, and get behind them and start praying for them in Jesus' name. Braden, go ahead and just begin ministering in, in, in psalm. Praise the Lord. And if everybody here will, for the next few moments, I don't know what time it is. I'm not even looking at the clock. Don't care. But if everybody for the next few moments will put your hands up and begin to pray in the Spirit with us to create the atmosphere for God. Come on, pray loud, but just close your eyes and begin to pray. Hallelujah.